Avatar The Way of Water is directed by James Cameron and arrives in theaters 13 years after destroying box office records back in 2009. Jake Sully lives with his newfound family formed on the extrasolar moon Pandora. But once a familiar threat returns to finish what was previously started, Jake must work with Natiri and the army of the Navi race to protect their home. I honestly thought that Avatar 2 would never come out. I didn't even think it would ever happen. It's been pushed back so far, it's been delayed for so long, and James Cameron is notoriously such a perfectionist and wants to invent new technology every time he touches a camera that I just assumed this movie would never happen. And I'll admit to being disappointed that he had basically invested so much time of his life and of his career into the Avatar universe. I like the first Avatar. I just rewatched it last night. I think it's a visually dazzling movie. Story-wise, it's been done before just in different ways, but of course it's undeniable that it was a technical achievement and it is a very entertaining, fun, crowd-pleasing movie. But it's not my favorite James Cameron movie and I was hoping that he would lean more into something else. Nevertheless, here we are with Avatar 2. It actually did happen and I remember when I heard the news article that he had already shot all of these sequences for the sequels even after this film and I was like oh wow he really is like just working on this as long as he wants. It's so crazy to even think about the fact that most films are restricted to a schedule like you can shoot your movie for 20 days or 25 days or six months or three months or two months or whatever. James Cameron seems to just like wake up and just work on Avatar every day for ever. But that's what happens when you've made the amount of great films that he has. He is truly a master of his craft. And if you ever actually have heard him talk about movies and the way he approaches filmmaking, like with his Masterclass course that I watched, it's really inspiring to hear just how in-depth he thinks about every single thing from a technical perspective in his film. And it's the best and worst part of both Avatar movies. I really, really enjoyed Way of Water. I think it's just like the first technically mind-blowing. It's absolutely staggering. Like, very rarely do I leave a movie and go, ah, yeah, I, I haven't got the first goddamn clue how they did that. I know actors are in mocap suits, but beyond that, pff, I got nothing. It's without a doubt a real movie, like, boldened in all capital letters. This is like the type of film you just don't see that much. And we've gotten now two of those this year between this and Top Gun Maverick. It's insane the amount of visual ingenuity that is constantly on display. I mean, in the first Avatar, you kind of get bored sometimes during the sequences with human Jake Sully. And you just kind of want to get them back to Pandora and all that cool stuff. This movie is like only blue people from beginning to end. It's, it's all blue people. <laughs> so I was in a constant state of awe from beginning to end. I just don't know how this movie was made. And it's, it's mind-blowing. Just like the first one, though, I will say that the stories are very simple. We've seen stories like this before, and that seems to be the trick of the Avatar franchise thus far, anyway. You tell a very simple story that's appealing to anyone, something like protect those you love. And then you paint that story on a massive canvas of otherworldly technology and places and things Fight. you've never seen before. But the true trick of the Avatar franchise, which James Cameron has pulled off thus far, is that both the first film and this film contain a very valuable message about our environment. Obviously, the first one was about protecting our forests, and this one is about protecting our oceans. And if any young kids can go and watch this movie and experience that message and understand why that's important, while also being entertained by people getting shot with bow and arrows a lot, then that's good. And that's what James Cameron is trying to do. And that's very clear. I mean, even in his real life, he's done a lot of activism for the environment. And so that's very important to him. And so if you appreciate the planet we live on and hope to preserve it, then Avatar 1 and 2 are going to have a deeper meaning for you and are going to feel more impactful. But that really is the trick of all crowd-pleasing audience entertainment, right? Big movies. It's always simple stories told in a very big way. I mean, Top Gun Maverick is just a dressed up surrogate father-son story, right? I mean, that's what it is at its core, and it's great. 
but there's also jets and it's amazing and fun. James Cameron is definitely tapped into the way to make these types of stories appealing. They just require a lot of goddamn time and money to do it the way he wants to. But just like the original Avatar, for the first half of this movie, I didn't find myself emotionally engaged all that much. You know, you're learning the environments you're in, you're, you're feeling out the characters, you're establishing a lot of different characters, and they are all in various different places in their lives, and they're all going through different struggles and hardships. And then right around the midpoint, just like the original, something devastating happens. And you're like, I'm fucking it. Do come to us. All those people who just did that thing, I want to see them pay. That's the hook the first film gave me, and that's the hook this one gave me too. So the last half of both Avatar movies is just incredible. Absolutely thrilling. The first half of both Avatar movies, I didn't really find myself all that engaged. Now, I'm talking purely about on an emotional level. There is always something to engage with on the screen in Avatar 2. You can stare at the screen with your jaw hanging slack for this entire movie, just wondering how it was done. And if you see it in 3D like I did, in fact, I don't even know if there are 2D options, maybe there are, but the screening was in 3D. And I am not a fan of 3D, and that is also a side effect of the first movie. It made it so popular that all of a sudden all these films were post-converting into 3D that were never supposed to be in 3D, which I'm assuming pissed off a lot of filmmakers. And every movie was in 3D forever, but gratefully for me, anyway, that's kind of leveled out. 3D has remained an option for at least a few showtimes a day for some of the bigger films. But now, with Avatar 2 being in 3D, it's not as impressive to me because the first film and the response to it from Hollywood, which is not Avatar or James Cameron's fault, the response to it from Hollywood to make everything 3D for a few years made the experience of watching movies in 3D rather tiresome. But there is no doubt in my mind that James Cameron has cracked the code for delivering the best possible 3D experience if you are forced or want to see this movie in 3D, because it is beautiful. It's very clear that James Cameron just doesn't accept something that doesn't look as real as it can. And I think even sometimes then, when something looks as real as it can, he says, well, can that be better? I will say there is an element of the film beyond the fact that the emotional hook didn't really land for me until halfway through that just doesn't work, at least in my opinion, of course. There's a young character in the film that is human who has sort of been left behind. He's a product of things that occurred in the original film, and he's sort of been adopted by the Navi. And his character is in the film a lot. And it's not that he's like annoying or bothersome, it's just that on the page, or in this case on the screen, I'm thinking about the screenplay, I just didn't really understand his motivation. He's very wishy-washy. In a strange way, he reminds me of the Mac character from Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Ray Winstone's a fine actor. He's not an annoying character that you wish wasn't in the movie, but you can't read him very well. He keeps switching sides. He'll do one thing for the good guys, then he'll do one thing for the bad guys, then he'll do one thing for the good, and you can't, you can't read him. And this kid, his name is Spider, the character in the film. I just, I couldn't, the motivation didn't feel clear to me. And I wish that that storyline landed better because it includes some important elements. Similar to the first, I think the thing that most people are going to be talking about is the final hour of The Way of Water because it is just nonstop. I mean, it's constant action drama, suspense, and tension. And Cameron does some very interesting things with the dynamics of parents and their children, and the roles they play, and how one can help the other or not help the other. And of course, at the end of the day, the thing that's, I think, hopefully really gonna stick with people is just that we need to protect our oceans. And I really admire Cameron for using this broad audience entertainment to hopefully convey a deeper message that could potentially enact people to take some things seriously that maybe they weren't thinking about before. Odds are, if you like movies, you're probably gonna go check out Avatar The Way of Water in theaters, but I do encourage you to, because anytime a big movie comes out in the theaters, I'm glad to see theaters supported. 
And even though this is technically a massive IP, it is an original thing that Cameron just kind of invented. And it's this world that's supported by two films and over a decade of work. So, you know, you can spend a few hours and go see it. Guys, thank you so much.